it was a personal journey that I went on. And then as I took that personal journey of inner healing, it impacted the other areas like my business and rebuilding and so forth. And even those clients that dropped off, I mean, yeah, it wasn't from a cash flow standpoint was not good at the time, but it was a blessing ultimately because they weren't the right clients, right? Because you attract who you are. And so I'm in this state of chaos and drama and all of this upset at home. And so you attract who you are, not what you want. So I was attracting clients that were challenging clients that were not listening, that were drama queens and all sorts of things, you know? And so it was kind of a gift, right? To have that clean slate, to be able to real rebuild on. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Nicole Jansen, who's going to share how to transform ourselves. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote is from Osho. Man in the West has succeeded in attaining all the affluence that the whole of humanity has been longing for down the ages. Outwardly, all is available but the contact with the inner is lost. Possessions are there, but the master has disappeared. Richness is there, but the man is not feeling rich at all. Think of this paradox. When you are outwardly rich, only then do you become aware of your inner poverty. In contrast, when you're outwardly poor, you never become aware of your inner poverty because there is no contrast. You write with white chalk on blackboards, not on whiteboards. Why? Because only on blackboards will it show the contrast is needed. Here's the reality. We have everything we need. There is no need for more. It's time to work on the inside. It's a place many of us don't want to go. But in my opinion, we must. We seem to be waiting for something to happen before we start this journey, but that only delays it and we lose the power and the rewards that come from taking that journey. Last week's action step was to pay attention to when I am not listening and waiting to respond. Most often we filter what others say. Have you taken a moment to just sit and listen? without judgment to what others are saying, and without creating a response, and allowing that silence to just be. Sometimes we also need to listen to what we're saying, because it's quite revealing. And that's our focus today. How do we create transformation within us? I hope you take the time to slow down and relax. If you're listening on the release date, it's the shortest day of the year. So be short with your work, take a breath, close out 2021, be clear on 2022. When you have clarity, everything becomes so much easier. It's really that simple. 
course, you know, doing simple is hard. Today, we're going to talk about the power of I am and being very careful of what words follow that. It's part of how you bring about the change you want to see. Over the past 30 years, Nicole Jansen has empowered thousands of business owners and visionary leaders to generate millions of dollars while making a greater positive impact on the lives of others. As a coach and a strategic advisor, she is passionate about helping leaders shift their perspective and solve complex business issues and relational issues. With the aim of creating a more just and prosperous world for everyone. She's founder of Discover the Edge and leader of the Transformation Podcast, reaching listeners in over 140 countries. Let's meet Nicole and transform our lives. Welcome to Richer Soul, Nicole Jansen. It's great to have you join us today. It's great to be here, Rocky. Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to learn from you today. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My parents were immigrants. And so they got an opportunity to start a business. My dad owned a garage business. My mother worked in the business, did all the paperwork. And they didn't really have a background, especially my dad did not have a background of of wealth creation, education or anything like that. I mean, my grandparents from from Holland never owned a car. They rode bicycles, lived in the same place for 50 years, that kind of thing. My mother came from a more affluent background in Germany, but really, you know, the whole idea of money wasn't um, wasn't something that they really talked about in terms of wealth creation. It was more about making it and, um, you know, and using it for for the day to day things and so forth. So they were good stewards from that perspective, although my dad was a spender and my mother was the saver. And I saw that really early on. Now, it's funny because when I was. When I was like, we're talking, you know, six, seven, eight years old, I would get uh, Christmas presents from my grandparents. Right. And so, you know, they'd send the box with all the goodies and stuff, but they always sent us a little bit of money. They send us 50 bucks or whatever. Birthdays send us 50 bucks. And I was a saver. And so I would put in the bank. And by the time I was like eight years old, I had all this money because I didn't use it, didn't waste it. So I had it in my bank account and I literally had already loaned out at that time. Now, this is back in the 70s, um, late 70s, early 80s. But I had about three hundred and sixty dollars out on loan to my brother and, you know, sometimes my parents, whatever. And my dad used to always joke with me and say, oh, that's so funny. You know, she put up there that she, you know, so and so owed her 25 cents. I'm like, no, it was more like three hundred and sixty dollars. It was not twenty five cents. But anyway, so it became a bit of a joke you know, that I was this saver. And I started to learn that that was actually not, not a good thing to do. And then later on, of course, realized that I was doing it the right way the first time around, you know? And so anyway, so that was kind of interesting. Tell me about that. Cause you said you work, you naturally were a saver, but then you said you were told it's not a good thing to do, but then you came back to it. So what was that? Yeah. So I saw the impact of my father's actions, risking, you know, betting the farm. And I actually at some point followed in those footsteps and try, and did that too and went, lesson number one, do not bet the farm because you might lose. And when I did, and he had he had done that as well, um, that it, you know, we know how to make it, but it's it's about keeping it's not how much you make it, so much you keep. So, but yeah, at that time when he was kind of making fun of me, right? And it was like this joke. I thought, well, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. So that's what I was referring to. But uh, my parents, as I said, were entrepreneurs when there's when I was seven, they started a, a home based business. In addition to the garage business uh, franchise, they had an ESO franchise and then a Sunoco. And they started a home based business um, in direct sales. And so I started working with them because I just said, hey, what can I do? Like, this is our, this is how I grew up. We knew uh, that we were all in it. My brother helped my dad at the garage. So I wasn't about to go to the garage and work there or do anything there. So I said, what can I do here? And so I started opening boxes and managing inventory and very quickly got into taking orders, compiling orders. So coming back to money, 
I learned how to compile and track and calculate and all of those things. So by the time I was 14, I was doing a good portion of the back end of the paperwork and and the compiling of the orders and processing and also for our upline who was traveling a lot. So I was already doing that at 14, 15 years old. When I was 16, I already had a business, you know, in school and selling jewelry, making jewelry. But when I was 16, I started my own business in uh, just, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be in business for myself. So I started a team in direct sales, but also started uh, selling things door to door. I want, I knew I, would, I just wanted to be in business. So I started uh, selling fax machines door to door to business owners. I would walk in the door because that was the easiest way to, you know, get to them. And so I would literally go around industrial areas and walk in the door and, and so forth. Quickly realized I wasn't excited about fax machines and went on to other things. And I've, you know, sold everything under the sun. The, the, direct sales business that we had, uh, it started to take off. And then my parents, be, um, who well, obviously were my upline, uh, my parents, it really, really took off when the three of us were working together. And this is my late teens. My dad was in the business and then he got out of the business and he came back in, which is a whole story. But um, when he came back in, it just, it was off to the races. He would do the presentations. My mother would build relationships. I handled the back end. It was a great match. And we built a, uh, an eight figure business. By the time I was in my mid twenties, we built an eight figure business. I wouldn't have had to work another day in my life. My parents, everything was set, vertical growth. This is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the way you look at it, it didn't quite work that way. And uh, with the money and the growth and the success, we had, we had, we had business in like 10, 11 countries. And, uh, you know, sometimes people's egos get in the way. And so our upline wanted all the credit and wanted to get involved, to get their hands in it. And I was like, just cash the checks, leave us alone. Let us do what we do and everybody else do what you do and you do your thing. And, you know, but that wasn't how it went. And so they, she, she started in particular, the woman, uh, started to undermine but both of them really started to undermine the relationships that my parents especially had built and, and directly hit, you know, um, their credibility. And so confusion set in and, uh, you know, people started to check out and it very quickly, and it's a long story, but it, you know, it quickly fell apart. So, but coming back to the whole thread of the finances is that my parents, because at some point he sold his garage businesses because we we're making so much money here. Um, he, one of the things my parents did not do, and this is more so my father's kind of approach to it, right, was spending it, was that they always thought that there was more coming. So when we get to this point, then we will do all these things, right? Put the financial plans, so forth. my mother put insurance in place and all this sort of stuff. And she was the saver, but boy, he, you know, they could spend it as quickly as they made it kind of thing. And I'm sitting in the background managing the finance and going, uh, it's not a really good idea. We need to be putting it in different areas and so forth. And so when we lost the business, we lost everything. And that's where I, my parents lost everything. I lost everything. And then it was like, well, that didn't work. And that's why I say, you know, it's like when I look back and said, okay, what did I learn from this process? First of all, I had the, the pity party. Why me? Why us? And all that stuff. We're nice people. <laughs> why did this happen to us? God, you know? Yeah. So I asked myself, you know, what did I, what did I learn from this? And that's where I went through this process of discovery of really understanding what I could take from this as lessons. I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about leadership, you know, about integrity and being in business with the right people. You know, I learned about mindset, all these things. And so, and certainly about money, right? To say, okay, well, I don't want to do that again because that didn't work, you know? And so that's where I extracted all of the lessons and, uh, really explored, okay, how could I use that? How could I help others go through the, who are going through, you know, business owners and entrepreneurs to avoid making those same mistakes? I also asked myself, like, what's my passion? Who am I? Like, what, what do I, like I said, what do I have to, have to offer? And so what I did was um, I discovered in that what my strength was, what my passion was. And then I built a business around that called Discover the Edge. I launched it in 2005, helping people. Actually, one of the, when you think about business, business is all about people. And so the first and foremost, uh, 
tool and principle that I wanted to teach is helping people to understand how to work with different personality types. And that quickly led into business coaching and, and all of that uh, going from there. And so because people started asking me, can you coach me? Uh, and when I was going into businesses, I was starting to see, wow, you know what? There's a lot more going on here. Yeah, we can help you and your team work more effectively together. However, you don't have the systems in place. You know, there's other th- chaos. The finances are not in place and all of that. And so that's where uh, that's where I, I launched the, the business and so forth. And I thought, OK, I had learned my lesson. We're on, you know, we're on track. We're moving forward. Of course, sometimes you get to repeat the lesson because then I bought a franchise, a business coaching franchise, which they so I had my business and I was piloting the business coaching and so forth. And and uh, and they came to me and these guys said, you know, we've got our system in place. You don't need to build a system. You can just use ours and it's going to be better and all that. And so I ended up buying that franchise and investing a lot of money in it into it. And literally, I realized, yeah, they had the systems, but their systems were really in their head. It wasn't documented, right? So I, I literally, I got the the operations manual in an email, and it wasn't an attachment; it was in the email. So, you know, I was like, "Are you kidding me?" But then, so I knew that they had the information. I knew they had the knowledge and the expertise, and so I spent the next four and a half years trying to make that whole thing work. And there was a lot. I learned a tremendous amount through that process about business. There was some great insight there. And I said things I still teach today. However, there was a similar issue happened there with egos and, and you know, not the, not the person with the intellectual property, but the person who was supposed to be building the franchise system itself didn't really know how to manage people and build franchises. And so anyway, so that, Franchise ended up falling apart. I lost my investment. I walked away from it. I couldn't with integrity sell it, even though I had somebody who wanted to buy it. I I just didn't feel right about that because I knew it was a sinking ship and it was just a matter of time. And so in in 2012, I walked away from that. And in a month later, my husband actually said, because I had gotten married, married an American, came down to California. And a month later, he said, yeah, I changed my mind. I don't want to be married. And so it was like this compounding blow after blow after blow. And I was literally, I was like, really? Are you kidding me? Like how poor of timing can you possibly have? Right. So spent the next couple of years trying to make that work and uh, which, you know, and then he eventually left and then it was just, it was this compounding effect and so forth. But um, you know, the, the lessons out of there were just incredible because what I what I learned about business, what I learned about myself, what I learned about like, okay, so this, this money piece, you don't get this money piece, right? It doesn't matter. You can make a lot of money, but it's, you're still going to end up starting over again. And I certainly learned in that process. I thought I'd learned it before, but I really learned it there. It's like, don't bet the farm. Don't invest what you are not willing to lose. And, and so, because I risked it all. And I, then when the business, I put a lot of money in the, in the beginning, but then as the, as I was trying to build it, there was extra money because it wasn't going exactly the way it's supposed to. I had to put more of my money in more and more of my money. So my condo put the money into the, you know, the, the business and I just kept pouring money in, pouring money in. And so I literally, I did the very same thing that my parents had done and uh, and then I was like, okay, that's it. I learned the lesson. We're not doing that again. And that's a difficult lesson to learn. Sometimes we have to go through it multiple times to be able to get over it. You know, at this point, you've had two runs with business. Your husband's left you. I think there were some other things going on in your life at the same point. How do you have resilience through all of this? How do you get back up? Yeah. My husband left in the end of 2014. And so I walked away from the franchise 2012. That was 2014. And literally I was like, at an, my attitude was not, you know, I was really frustrated. Like I did not enjoy, I was not enjoying the process. If that makes sense. And so um, I kind of said like to myself, you know, if anybody else wants to leave, you can leave now. It's kind of my attitude. Well, be careful what you wish for. 
because literally all of my clients, except for one client, dropped off within a two month period of time. I actually, well, I shouldn't say that. The, the, my biggest client, I ended up firing him because he was sabotaging his own business. And so I was like, not going to go down another ship. But, um, and we had tried to work together, but he just was hell bent on being self, self destructing and not getting, not taking feedback. And so I had let him go. And then I had a bunch of these other clients that did. So it was literally, and then my dad passed away in 2016, my mother in 2018, it's just been like an ongoing thing. So um, of compounding impact. And so in the process that way, it was really, really important for me to create an, uh, a firm foundation to build on was to understand what my identity, who was I coming back to those questions, who am I? Um, what do I have to offer? You know, what am I going to do with this? You know, um, forgiveness became really, really important. Letting go of the bitterness and the resentment and the of the people that betrayed me, you know, in business multiple times. Right. The business with my with my 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 family, this the you know, the the franchise with the um, the promises that weren't fulfilled and how much that cost me. And then of course, with my, with my husband and so forth. So it was really, it was a personal journey that I went on. And then as I took that personal journey of inner healing, it impacted the other areas like my business and rebuilding and so forth. And even those clients that dropped off, I mean, yeah, it wasn't from a cash flow standpoint was not good at the time. But it was a blessing ultimately because they weren't the right clients, right? Because you attract who you are. And so I'm in this state of chaos and drama and all of this upset at home. And so you attract who you are, not what you want. So I was attracting clients that were challenging clients that were not listening, that were drama queens and all sorts of things, you know? And so it was kind of a gift, right? To have that clean slate to be able to real rebuild on. And sometimes you need that, right? And of course, the growth doesn't happen at the top of the mountain. It happens in the valleys. And yeah. you had a few valleys to go through, as we all do. And the question is, you know, when you're in the bottom of the valley is how do you always get up? And that's not always easy to do. And you've continued to do it. If I remember correctly, you had a spiritual component to this in helping you to find yourself. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So when I was at my bottom, right, you talk about the valley and I was, I, you know, it was the lowest point. I really had to lean on something more, something that was a firm foundation to build on because what I had built my confidence on clearly wasn't working. And, you know, and that's what I find a lot of times people will do is that they will put their trust in external things. And when those things fall away, what have you got? And so at that point, I had lost everything, really lost even all my relationship, I mean, my parents passing away and all that. My husband, all the people that were closest to me really, you know, disappearing other than, of course, my brother is still alive and he's got his family and so forth. But um, it just felt very, I felt very alone. And so what I did is I sought my identity in something greater than me and something that came from within. And so for me, that was God that was asking God, like, so if you want to know the, the identity and the purpose of a thing, you ask the one that created it, you ask the architect. And so I asked God and said, like, OK, God, what the heck? And what do I do now? Who am I and what do I do now? And so I was able to through that discover that, you know what, I am, I am loved. I am worthy. I am valuable simply because I am, I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. The human experience is great. And you can, you know, the trappings and so forth are great, but that's does not determine my value. That doesn't determine who I am. And so for me to become unshakable, to become the calm in the midst of the storm was to anchor myself to something that was unchanging, that was eternal and forever, right? Was so the idea that I am loved, I'm a spiritual being, I'm loved, I am chosen, I am worthy, I am valuable. 
and then disconnecting. So, you know, all the things that are the external things then become gravy. They become bonuses. They become tools and things that we can use. Like, so for example, our, you know, I think of the, the seven A's are is something that I have uh, identified as external validations, things that we oftentimes will place our identity in. So the first one, for example, is archetypes. It's the Enneagram and the disc and all that. I use all that. Great. To help people understand themselves and others better so they can build better relationships and more effective teams. But it's not where they derive their identity. Their identity is already established as being a spiritual being, worthy, acceptable, approved, secure, and then those things are like, oh, wow, yeah, so I kind of operate this way. This is my behavioral preferences and so forth. So number one is archetypes. The second one is acquisitions. A lot of times people gain their identity from acquisitions. They'll gain their identity from how much can I earn? And, if, and it really comes down to having a, a desire to, to believe and to validate yourself and, and to prove that you're enough, that you're enough. It's an enoughness conversation, right? And, and so because most people's identity, and mine was too, was really rooted, and I didn't realize this at the time, but was really rooted in not enough. And so if I, it's like this primary lie that we learn when we're kids, and it all comes out differently depending on personality styles and so forth and our natural bent. But, um, you know, this idea of like, I'm insignificant or, I'm a failure. I'll never be enough or I'm not smart enough or not fast enough or not attractive enough or whatever the case is. And then what we do is we spend the rest of our life trying to outrun that and prove that that's not true. But we're actually operating from that place of it being a truth that we have to actually refute. So acquisitions, it's like the more if I get more then maybe I'll be enough. You know, if an archetype, like I say, if a personality assessment says that I'm really awesome, then maybe I'm enough. Uh, the third one is accomplishments. So I accomplish things. I want to be successful. This is very common, actually, as I work with leaders. A lot of times you get an overachiever and, you know, you ask them why they're doing what they're doing. They really check in and they realize because they're trying to prove to their father or they're trying to prove to himself that they're good enough. Bottom line, that they have the they have the right stuff that they can make it, make it happen. And so accomplishments is a bit, and a big one. Another one is accolades, you know, the people's uh, approval, right. Getting the awards and the certificates and the degrees and all of that stuff. Associations is another one. I associate with this group of people. So therefore I'm at the country club or I'm here, or I have this group. And so I'm at this church or whatever. And so we derive our identity oftentimes by, the associations and the clubs that we're part of, sports club, whatever. And then all of a sudden that's gone. Like, so for example, for me, um, that's one that was very eye-opening for me because with our organization that we have, it was a very large organization, thousands of people, and all of a sudden that's gone. And it's like, wow, who am I without that? Who am I without my money? Who am I without my relationships? Who am I without all of this community that I had that I didn't even know that I was actually because our beliefs, our beliefs are determined right by our environment and all of that right and how upbringing and and so forth and so it was like wow who am I without all of that like I'm not going to these meetings now I'm not talking to these same people like what is it it's just me it's just me so when it was just me and I was like God it's you and me like okay what do we look at it so I mentioned also about attractiveness is another one. People get driving their track. Women do that a lot, but even guys, right? They got, you know, they got to prove they're a stud. They got to whatever, you know, prove that they're masculine, manly enough. You know, uh, women want to feel beautiful. They want to be attractive. But I know there's, of course, not going to get into the whole gender, uh, you know, identity conversation. But there's that attractiveness of desiring to be attractive to to um, other people and and to the world. And then the last one, which I did identify with quite a bit at some point was adversity. I actually derived my identity. You hear people say, if you knew what I have been through, you would understand, right? You have no idea what I had to go through, you know? And um, it's, it's, and I have compassion for that because I've been through some stuff too. We all have, as you said, 
But when we derive our identity from the adversity, then we get stuck there. It's a one thing to say that's my the experience I've had in life. It's another thing to say I am. So I failed in business, let's say. My family, we failed in business. But taking it on as an identity is to say is I am a failure. And that's a big difference. And when you start saying I am a failure or I am neglected or I am, I don't belong, right? I'll never make it. You know, those I ams are very powerful. And so both positively and negatively, what we say, there's actually a scripture in the, in the Bible where Moses, he says to God, he says at the burning bush, the famous story about this burning bush, right? He meets God and he says to God, well, you know, who are you? What's your name? And he says, I am that I am. Now, we're made in God's image, right? So what does that make us? I am. And whatever we speak and declare after I am, I am no good at this. I am going to be tired tomorrow. I am uh, amazing. I'm a powerhouse. I'm, you know, a great salesperson. I'm really good with money. Or what do they say? I'm terrible with money. I've never been good with money. My parents were good with money. My brother's not good with money. Nobody's good with money. It's just the way I am. Or it's just the way it is. And so it's this identity. It's like disconnecting and coming out of agreement with the lie, right? Of scarcity, not enoughness and coming into the truth about who you are. And so that's what I did. The long explanation, but it's hopefully that helps somebody who's listening is just to, you know, see it's like, wow, disconnecting from these things, pulling all these plugs and these anchors and sometimes like chains out so that we can just show up as who we are, whole and complete, worthy, loved, accepted. I belong. I'm chosen. I'm here for a reason. I'm not a mistake. I'm not a mistake. And some people, you know, maybe they were surprised to their parents. They may have been a surprise to their parents, but they weren't surprised to God in my, my belief, right? And so nobody's here by accident. Nobody's here without a purpose. Every single person, if you're on this planet, you have a purpose and you have value to bring to the marketplace. You have value to bring to the world. And so it's from that place that I could build a foundation and say, I don't have to now determine whether that's true or not, because I've assigned, I've assessed and, and decided and believed that that is true. Then I can build from that. The other thing is, is that when people criticize me, like, okay, well, sorry, you feel that way, right? They don't like the way, they don't want to work with me or whatever. I, I don't get, I don't get all shaken. COVID hit, everybody started freaking out. Is the job, you know, their job was lost. They didn't have enough toilet paper and all this stuff. It's like, tr everybody's triggered all over the place, you know? And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. And they used to ask me, right? People were asking me at the time, you're like, how are you doing? Are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I mean, I've been through the valley. So like, this was a, a bleep and, and I'm, not I'm not diminishing it. But for me, in terms of my uh, groundedness, it was like, oh, wow, you know, and I, my heart goes out to those that are struggling. My heart goes out and I don't like what's happening in terms of and I'm concerned about the people that are getting sick and dying and all the stuff that's going on. But from a standpoint of being centered and grounded, it, it didn't actually have any effect on me. That's impressive. I've never heard all of the different I am's put the way that you did it. And as you were going through them, I'm like. Oh, yeah, that, that's an identity. That's an identity. Oh, yeah, people do that identity. And it was, I, I think it was eye opening to people to realize how many different ways they let society or externals identify themselves and then how often they say that. And I think more often than not, people are oblivious to what they say they are. And yes. I can hear it. Like when I have conversations, I listen to what people are saying and you'll hear people tell you the truth, but it's not directly like they're saying those underlying kind of tones and you start to hear it. And it's quite interesting. And, and I like the way that you laid that out. Today's episode is sponsored by Profit Answer Man podcast. 
Did you know that most small business owners hate looking at their financials? It's one reason they may struggle with business success. The Profit Answer Man podcast helps them ensure they are profitable and can pay their employees and weather the storms we all have to face. It's built on the Profit First methodology of pay yourself first. The Profit Answer Man podcast is a must listen to for every small business owner and anyone who wants to help them survive and thrive. Check it out on your favorite listening platform. How do you let go of all those I am's? Because that's not easy to do. I think, first of all, most people probably don't even realize how many they're stuck to. Yeah. Well, transformation starts with awareness. So the first thing is you got to recognize what you're actually saying. And so I have people write down and say, what is it that you're telling yourself? Either internally or verbally speaking it out. What are those things that you're saying? Let's take money. What do you tell? What do you believe about money? What do you say about money? And what do you say about yourself as it relates? What's your relationship with money? Right. So they get to see, wow, I didn't even know that, you know, it's like I'll, I heard a, a young woman one time. She said, well, I guess I'll I, I put 20. She was young, 23 years old or whatever. And and uh, she had just put a cruise on her credit card. And she said, well, I guess it doesn't really matter because I'll be in debt the rest of my life anyway. Wow. Like, where did that come from? And I was like, hang on a moment. Let's just back up for, you know, like, and so she was making that determination. And so um, not realizing that it was actually giving her a death sentence, a debt sentence for the rest of her life. And so the first thing is awareness. You got to be aware of the lie. Now, if you're working with a coach, like what I do is I'll, uh, I identify and saying, okay, what's that line? Where'd that come from? Let's let's see where that came from and how that's played out in your life in different ways, because there's a, like a primary tap root, if you will. Right. Our roots determine our fruits. So if you think of a tree, the roots are all of the, the mindset, the beliefs, beliefs that we have about ourselves, others in the world around us. The, the trunk is kind of like the actions and behaviors, strategy, and all that fun doing stuff. So there's being which is the roots doing is the is the trunk, if you will. And then the uh, fruits, the you know, the foliage and whatever, that's the, that's the fruits, um, the leaves and all of that stuff. And so, um, but when you look at that tap root, there is, there's like that, not enough. What does it sound like to you? And then what are the extension? What are the, all the branches that's kind of extended off of that? So you kind of see, you get a, a real assessment on what's actually happening that is impacting the fruits of your life. And then from there, then you just, then you take that taproot, it's a primary one, and you create a new, you come out of agreement with it and you create a new I am statement. So if I believe that I am not important, right? Maybe the I am statement is I am valuable or I am worthy. And most people, as they start going through this process, some will just resonate differently. You know, they'll be like, oh, that's the one that really speaks to my heart. You know, we can say things like, you know, you can be at a seminar and they'll say, I'm a money magnet, you know, money is attracted to me every day. Yeah, that's all fun. And, and those can work when you own them. But this is getting to a deeper level of who I am. And um, aside of the money and all of that stuff. And so awareness Choosing to come, and the second thing is choosing, is choosing to come out of agreement with the lie, identifying what's the truth about me. What does God say about me? If he created me, or higher power, or universe, or whatever, if, I'm, if the universe is abundant, and I am an extension, if you will, of the abundant universe, then what does that make me? Abundant, right? I'm capable of so much more than I've allowed, that I've allowed myself to believe. So I'm going to create a new I am statement, and I'm going to anchor that thing. I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to reinforce, 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 reinforce. When those lies come up, because we have neural pathways in our brain that have been developed over years, decades, just like any muscle, right? When we create a new neural pathway, it's going to take a little bit of time. 
to build that, whether it's a habit or it's a declaration or like a belief system. And so it takes time. Gradually over time, the old will start to atrophy, but you got to reinforce it. When that lie comes in, you say, no, that is not who I am. I am this, right? I, and you keep declaring it, declaring, declaring it. Your subconscious mind's like a problem solver, right? So, and, and it's used to just going with whatever you've told it. Doesn't know the difference between what's real or imagined. So you start creating a new, hey, look, if you're going to make a story up, make it a good one for heaven's sakes, right? So make up the story, make up like, what is it? You know, who is it that I choose to be that is going to align with what I actually want in life? And that's how you can create a great life. Because just like with that analogy of a plant or a tree, you can have a tree, a beautiful big oak tree, and you put it in a little planter. So the beliefs and all of that, which is the the roots down here, and it's in this little planter, it's not going to grow into a big oak tree. It is going to grow only to the size that that container allows for it. And so you've got to expand the container through your beliefs and all of that, uh, transforming your beliefs so that you can have the capacity to grow and to achieve the goals and dreams that you have in life. And it's much more than just saying the words to yourself. You do have to do the hard work. Yeah, it's owning it. It is literally viscerally feeling it and stepping into it. Your actions have to follow your words. You can't just say the words and expect it to occur magically. You've, you've got to go through and, and do the work that that happens from there on. That's the follow through. So that's the third step is then choice. And then you got to take action on it. Take action. You got to do something. Other. That's where the secret was an eye opener for a lot of people. But it was also in some ways it was de- detrimental because people thought, oh, you mean I'm just going to lay on my couch and visualize the Ferrari and the Ferrari is going to show up on my doorstep. Uh, it doesn't really exactly work that way. But you may be lit on your couch visualizing and declaring who you are and so forth. And then an idea is going to pop in because that capacity just increased and you, your, your uh, reticular activating system got engaged. And so now you're starting to see opportunities where you didn't see it before because you live in an abundant universe. You live in an abundant world, but you didn't see it because your mind said, I'm not whatever it is, or this will never work for me. And so literally you walk, you walked by opportunities and you didn't even, you know, your brain didn't even register it. It was like discard it because that doesn't valid. That's not, that's not um, in alignment with the belief that you have about yourself. So the way I look at this is okay. I want a Ferrari. How much is a Ferrari? And then I start thinking, what are the ways I can get that kind of money to be able to buy a Ferrari? Or is there another way to even get access to a Ferrari without having to do that? And I think this is where people. People limit themselves a little too much because I'm thinking, well, the easiest, fastest way to get a Ferrari for me, maybe I should go apply a job as a salesperson at the Ferrari dealership. They'll probably let me drive a Ferrari, (laughs) right? Like inside of a week, with any luck, I could be driving a Ferrari. And but you don't see that possibility until you you start to think it through and start figuring out how to make it happen. Or you figure out how to make the money to buy a Ferrari. But at the end of the day, what I tell people is, before you pick that dream, go sit in the Ferrari. Because I've had many men tell me, yeah, we went and sat in the Lambo, and we didn't fit. So it wasn't a dream worth chasing. So make, and, and that's not true just for that, but it's it's make sure that what you want is really fits you and you're not chasing the image of something instead of the reality of something. Yeah. Because then you may go down the wrong road. And so. Make sure that what you think you want is actually what you want. Yes. And to your point about the Ferrari is what a lot of times people say, oh, I dream about a Ferrari. So this is where the beliefs and the I am's come in is they hear it. It's very subconscious. Most people do not hear what's actually going on. That's why the awareness is the first step. They don't know the conversation that's running in their head because it's so familiar to them that they don't want anything different. So that's why I coach or mentor somebody kind of says, Hey, do you know what you just said that? I mean, I've had clients where I'm like, Hey, do you know how many times you said hope or maybe, or try in the last five minutes? Like, do you have any, because if these are diminishing words and uh, so in terms of the Ferrari as an example, because a lot of times people say, I dream of having the Ferrari, but I mean, who am I to do that? Or, 
you know, you talk about getting a job at the Ferrari dealership and the immediate thing is either A, they say, yeah, I'm capable of doing that. I could sell a Ferrari or they go, who am I to sell a Ferrari? I don't know anything about Ferraris. I don't know anything about how to selling car, you know, how to sell a car. And then they talk themselves out of it. And that's the whole conversation. That's the beliefs which are attached to their identity, right? If they don't believe that they're that kind of person, there's other people that are very successful. And for them, they're like, I want a Ferrari. How do I do it? I go do this. You know, this is how I could get it. Here's how I could make that happen. They go out and do it and it's done. And they're like, what's the big deal? No big deal for you because you have a belief system that says that you're worthy and you're capable. And if anything, you can figure it out. But there's unfortunately, there's the mass uh, group, you know, people. And even I was in that, you know, because this is something for me. I used to ask myself questions like, what's wrong with me? Why is this not working? Or what? Wrong question. Because when I get the answer to that question, it's like, well, because you're an idiot. I'm like, well, that's helpful. Right. So it's, you know, so you got to ask yourself different questions. What am I learning here? What's working about this? What's not working? It's not about right or wrong. It's about what's working in this situation to get me the result that I'm looking for. Or What's not working and what can I change and improve and learn and and all of that. And so it does, it it always comes back to what people think. I can have, and I've worked with thousands of people, coached thousands and trained thousands of people around the world, five continents. And it's amazing. You get two salespeople or two CFOs or two whoever, and they can have the same product. They can have the same opportunity. They can have the same everything to work with. And one believes it's possible for them and that they're capable of it, and the other one doesn't, and their results are dramatically different. And it's like Henry Ford would say, you know, either whether you think you can or you think you can, either way, you're right. And so both of them fulfill their own prophecy. But that prophecy, sometimes the way that belief system is so deeply ingrained that they're just, it's amazing. People will say, oh man, I'm gonna be tired tomorrow. Why would you ever say that? Do you want to be tired? No, but I just know I will be because like I was up late and I went, worked out and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, you don't have to be. What if you said to yourself, worst case scenario, nothing changes, but give it a shot and try it and say, well, you know what? I'm going to sleep so good tonight and I'm going to wake up refreshed and energized and vibrant. Can't wait for tomorrow. It's a very different way to live life. It's all in our outlook. And what we want from life. That's our guide point. That's our guidepost. Yeah. But then you still do the work. So kind of taking a step forward here. What are some of the things we can learn from some of the greatest leaders that are out there? Well, one of the things that we can learn is resilience. We've been talking a lot about adversity. Leaders, sometimes people think great leaders had it easy. That's kind of an excuse, right? Well, look at them. Look how easy it was for them. their parents. Blah, blah, blah. The reality is, is that every great leader, true great leader in history went through adversity. It was, like you said, it was their outlook. They had a vision. They were determined. And they, maybe it's their beliefs that they needed to change or whatever. They needed to do something to make the shift. And they were willing they were willing to do the work, as you've been talking about. It's they, they were willing to do the hard work, the inner work and the outer work to be able to be successful. That's number one, resilience. The number two, I would say, is empathy. Great leaders have empathy. So they, they recognize that even though they may be a high performer, they recognize everybody's going through their experience at their own pace and they're on different stages. And so some people are not going to get it. Not, some people are going to say things that are, that are detrimental to themselves and others and all that. And it's having empathy for the experience that people are having and encouraging them and lifting them up. And the last thing I'll say is maybe even comes as first is they have vision. They have vision. They've got to know, and you talked about, you got to have an, what's your outlook? What are you going for? Where there is no vision, people perish. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. These are ancient principles. And so when we don't know where we're going, we start finding ourselves wandering and there's no purpose to it. Or we find, find ourselves going in circles or we find out going somewhere that wasn't actually where we're like, wow, well, this isn't where I wanted to go. You know, I just started driving. And there's actually as crazy as it sounds. 
there's a lot of people right now that are just out driving, taking a, you know, taking a drive and not actually having set their destination in their GPS system to say, this is actually where I want to go. And I really do want that. And this is why I really want that, because this is going to mean X, Y and Z for me. And then working backwards from there. I would say 99 percent of people. Are just driving around cluelessly in life. That's what I tend to see. And it's sad because school doesn't, again, having the empathy is it's sad. I don't judge it. I don't criticize it because, shoot, I was there one time, too, at a certain uh, certain level. And we all in some area of our life do that. Right. Maybe it's not in business, but maybe it's in relationships or maybe it's in health or whatever. Right. So we can all relate. But, you know, it's looking at it and saying, wow. You know, it is sad. It is sad because t- school does not teach us. And this is the kind of stuff that you really need to know. The rest is you figure it out when you unlock the, you know, human genius, right? The, the innovative, creative genius of a, of a human being, they figure out the rest. But you got to get this piece first. That you do. So. Do you have any advice for people like how do how do they get started on figuring out what they truly want? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, like we talked about is, you know, that lie and that truth is going through that process, right, of identifying what are the things you're saying to yourself? That's part of it. But is sitting down and saying, what do you really want? And actually even changing that language to what do I really desire? Because when you think of the word want, I'm a big NLP language person, I realize how powerful our words are. Words create our world. Life and death is in the power of our tongue. The word want actually is lack. So I want for nothing. What does that mean? I lack for nothing. Okay. So rather than we use that word a lot, I want, I want, I want. When you look at desire, the definition of desire is excited for. What am I excited for? So again, not coming from that. We don't even realize that we're coming from that place of scarcity. I want, which means I don't have it and I want to get it versus what am I excited for? Because I desire it. Bible also says, God will give you the desires, the secret petitions, the desires of your heart. You can say the wants of your heart, right? So, um, so that's, so really identifying what do you desire? Now, how do you find what your desire? I find a lot of times people have a hard time with that because they might desire a lot of things. But if you look at what you don't, desire what angers you what frustrates you you know maybe maybe you just hate people seeing people in poverty you hate seeing maybe you know you work with finance and you know you hate seeing companies destroyed over you know poor financial habits or you hate seeing families destroyed because of you know poor money habits and so forth and you say i'm going to do something about that and so oftentimes our purpose is actually hidden in our pain and in our frustration. So when you identify that, then you don't focus on that. That's not where you stay, but that gives you a clue into your purpose. And then you can, so you take the opposite positive and go, okay, so if I hate seeing that, what's the positive and how can I provide a solution for that? And then you run for that and say, that's what I'm excited for. And in your life, you know, you ask yourself, like, what, what do I really desire? Like, And and when you extract and you get rid of all these external validations, which are a lot of busyness, what do I really, what, what actually allows, when do I feel the most alive? It's not the Ferrari. Yeah, I like cars, you know, rolling down the road in a Ferrari, but it's actually not the Ferrari that's giving you that experience, right? Or that feeling, right? It's the feeling of freedom. I want freedom, right? Desire. I want to desire freedom. What does that look like for me? Do I need the Ferrari to get the freedom? Or maybe I could have it a different way. What's really most important to me? And run for that. And then all the other stuff is like accoutrements. And I'll use one last thing is like the the Bible talks about seek first the kingdom of God and all other things will be given unto you. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is peace, love, gentleness, you know, uh, generosity, all of those things, right? Joy. We We seek those things. And then all the rest of it comes because of who we are being, because we attract who we are, not what we want. It's all tied together. I think people really struggle with tying together spirituality and success and desires. 
And for so long, they were put into separate realms. And there's so much baggage in that area. And so it's letting go of all the baggage and figuring out who you are. What is it that you desire? Right. And then creating an action plan to get towards it and taking the first step towards that. And once you have your target, it it becomes so much easier to get to that. So speaking of action, what is an action step people can take this week to move forward in their life? Well, I think what we talked about is a great place to start is take a journal, go get some quiet time this week. Do yourself the favor, give yourself the gift, go turn off the technology, get some quiet time and check in with yourself. Check in with yourself. What have you been saying to yourself? What have you been striving for towards? And do you, do, is that really actually what you desire to have in your life? I think that's the first step. Start doing that and you'd be amazed at what comes out of that. You get some ahas. Now, don't beat yourself up, right? Recognize it, acknowledge it, and go, wow, that's really interesting that I've been doing that. Then I would say, you know what? Go find, go find a coach. Go find somebody that can help you get through it. And even if, or a buddy or somebody like that, even to hold you accountable and say, I'm going to make, you talked about taking action, making, I'm going to make certain steps to make changes in these areas. And so then I need somebody who's going to hold me, you know, going to hold me accountable to that. Now, what they can also do if they want for, you know, for myself, I'm very busy with clients. I have no shortage of clients, but if they are serious about making those changes, they can certainly go to leadersoftransformation.com forward slash coaching learn a little bit more about me. Um, And I say it's not about me, but like just so they can feel like how I operate as a coach and what that would mean to them because it's really more about them. And um, and they can schedule a a free 45 minute consult with me and we'll have a conversation. And if so, if they're not clear on the plan or how do I I know I see all this stuff and I don't know what to do with all this. And how do I get from here to there? Because I got to make this huge pivot. Then we can talk it through. And it's very value based. I'm I'm not a person to fluff, and I don't like sales pitches. So from that sense, like you know, sale you go on a call and get, you know, uh, just a whole sales pitch. That's not my my deal. So it's very value based. You walk away with, you know, actionable items to move forward with. And you know, then if it makes sense to talk about coaching, we can talk about that as well. But I don't know how long I'd be able to do that just because of the my schedule and so forth. But if people want right now, it's still up there. Um, that opportunity. And so if they want to go and do that, they can do that. And that's for, as I said, that's for leaders, as people who are serious. Because one thing, I am a very results driven person. So I will, I will challenge you and encourage you. But it's this, it's a blend of drive and flow. And by the way, I operate. You got to be ready to run. You know, it's funny. I I remember something I used to tell people to do, and, and it's been a long time since I've mentioned it. I would tell people, go buy a lottery ticket, you know, one of those mega millions, spend a dollar or two, and then go dream. What would your ultimate life look like? If I won this ticket tomorrow, that's the prompt. And you don't even have to buy the ticket. You know, you can just go with the prompt. If I won a hundred million dollars tomorrow, what does my day look like? Who's in it? Who's out it? Where do I live? What does everything look like? And that just gives you the freedom to choose without limits. And then yeah. you begin that process of saying, what's it really look like? Yeah. Kind of like the if time or money was not an object, what would you do? It's that question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Pretty much that's it. It's time to learn the secrets of life. What's your secret to living an abundant life? Reflection. Checking in with myself, getting grounded and centered and present with myself. How often do you check in? Daily, multiple times a day. Whenever I feel myself not being present, I just notice where I'm wandering off. I'm I'm constantly grounding myself again. And I find no matter how good you are at this, it's a constant battle. (laughs) Totally. 
What did you learn later in life that you wish you would have learned sooner? I think the money piece is a big one. Yeah. If I had started investing that money that I had as a kid and kept that going and then, you know, on the side of that, investing the, the extra, I'd be in a very different place. I mean, hey, got there anyway, but I mean, it, it, it would have been a lot better had I started young. And, and what it does is it allows you the freedom to fail. It allows you the freedom to try things and it allows you to also say no. Because when you get into a bad situation, you're like, you know what? I'm out of here. And that's always nice. If you were to give an 18-year-old one specific piece of wisdom, what would it be? Fail fast. Fail forward. I sound like Gary Vee. But, you know, it really is like take risks. So not to contradict what I just said, but take risks. Try things out. Learn. How do you know if you like something? Well, you can't stand on the sidelines and, and imagine whether or not you like soccer or football. You got to be in the game and then you figure it out along the way. So you got to be in action, in motion. A body at motion tends to stay in motion. motion. Body at rest tends to stay at rest. So I would tell that 18 year old is try a bunch of things, figure out what you like, what you don't like and fail forward fast. Learn from it, though. Learn from it. Just don't keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. But check in, do a debrief. Ask yourself four questions. What worked about this and why? What didn't work and why? What am I learning? What can I do to change or improve it uh, going forward? Or if it worked well, what can I do to leverage it? You ask yourself those four questions over and over and over again. And it's not about what did I do right? Notice the language. It's not about what did I do right or what did I do wrong? Because people don't like to be wrong. And they put themselves in a it's defensive mode when you do that. So it's what worked and what didn't work. And remember, don't bet the farm on one thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Take small leaps that you can recover from and you'll continue to leap your way to success. If people would like to connect, learn more about your materials, what's the best place for them to check you out? Yeah, leadersoftransformation.com is the best place. Yeah, they can find out more about my podcast. We have 400 episodes plus episodes up there now. And uh, yeah, lots of great information. And then then from there, they can find me on social and everywhere else or, or book a time to talk to me. And we will put that all in the show notes to make it easy for people to find you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure, Rocky. Thank you for having me. I love the concept of desire. We are on a run with defining your life and desires, and creating the steps forward. Your past is not defining you, and you have the ability to decide who you want to be. We all need help, so find someone who can help you take that next step. Life's too short not to do so. As we wrap up 2021, I hope you've already have your 2022 plans locked and loaded to execute. Did you check in on your answer to what comes after I am? This week's action step was to find some quiet time to check in with yourself and decide what you desire. Getting clarity makes life so much easier. Hopefully you have the downtime during the holidays to get this done for yourself. It's the most important step, defining the goals and targets, and then creating the steps to achieve those goals. Hey, if you enjoyed today's episode, I'd appreciate it if you'd share it with a friend. And thank you if you've done so. Next week, we have on Mark Briggs to talk about harmony in life and dealing with resilience, resets, and ripples. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.